Hello and welcome back to this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine from scratch. The VM that we're building, and indeed computers of all kinds, are limited by various factors. Key metrics that come to mind are how many instructions per second the CPU is capable of running, or how fast and with what fidelity the computer can push pixels to the screen, and how large the maximum memory space of the system actually is. In modern computers, memory space is no longer a concern, as they can support hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. But the VM has a measly 64 kilobytes. Granted, it doesn't need to have anywhere near as much as a modern computer, but when this VM becomes a fantasy game console, a little more space for data and graphics could definitely go a long way. This hard limit of 64 kilobytes comes from the fact that the 16-bit number can only represent values up until 65,535, meaning that it's simply not possible to assign more unique addresses than that. There are some tricks that will allow us to sidestep this problem, and the one that we'll focus on today is called bank switching. The idea is simple. You select some region of memory space, for example, the first 255 bytes, and you allow that space to point to different banks of 255 bytes. All you need is a mechanism with which the programmer can control which bank is being pointed to at any time. And we might control this with something as simple as a one byte register, offering a possible 255 different banks. That allows the first 255 bytes to actually represent a full 64 kilobytes of memory, as much as we have for the entire machine right now. Now, of course, this is a trade-off. We gain more space to work with data, but this memory isn't transparently available, nor is it continuous. A data structure that crosses a bank boundary is going to be difficult to work with, so anyone working with the system has to be very aware of this abstraction. This technique was very common in the early cartridge-based game consoles like the NES or the Game Boy or the Mega Drive. And it was an extremely practical solution because the hardware controlling the bank switching could actually be embedded in the cartridges rather than the console, allowing the game developers to extend the limits of the system as they needed. In order to build this in JavaScript, we're gonna have to first add the new register. Currently, there are two places in the code where we would need to add that new register, so let's turn that into a single common source of truth. I'll create a file called registers.js, exporting an array of all the register names, including the new memory bank or MB register. Then we can open cpu.js and require the registers array. We can delete this.register names, instead using registers when creating the memory region. Now the second place that we need to update is in assembler slash index.js. Here we've got an object where each key is a register name and the value is the corresponding register index. So we can require registers and create this object dynamically using reduce instead. We're reducing into the map object where each value is a register name and we can use the third argument of the reducer function to get the index then map reg name gets set to the index and we can return the map. And with the new register added, we can now focus on the banking mechanism. We're gonna build on top of the memory mapper abstraction that we built in episode five. We'll open up the main index file and delete everything under the memory mapper mm. We're gonna have a function called create banked memory, which will take a number n, a bank size and a CPU which of course is just a reference to the CPU object itself. N is gonna be the number of banks that we have access to, and bank size will determine how many bytes each bank can hold. There are other methods of building this mechanism that don't require exposing the CPU object, but this way we can keep things simple and build on the kinds of functionality that we already have in the VM. We can create N array buffers, each with bank size bytes. You remember from episode 5 that the memory mapper interface is actually the same as the data view interface, so to create the bank interfaces, we'll map over the bank buffers that we just created and return a new data view for each item inside. 
our mapped device needs to expose this same data view interface and somehow decide which bank it should use to forward the operation to. The four methods that we currently use from the data view interface are getUint8, getUint16, setUint8, and setUint16. We can create an interface with these methods exposed by using reduce again. We'll have our data view out and the function name. And for each function name, we'll add a key to data view out that calls forward to data view with that same function name. Then we can return data view out. Now forward to data view will be a function that first takes a name and then returns a function that takes some additional arguments. These are going to be the arguments we pass to methods like set you in 16 or get you in 8. In order to work out which bank to use, we get the value in the memory bank register modulo the number of banks that we have. That will ensure that if we ask for data for a bank that we don't actually have, we'll just wrap around instead to a bank index that we definitely do have. Then the memory bank to use is just bank with that index. Finally, we can return memory bank to use with the name of the method we want to call and spread out all of the arguments that we just got. And finally, at the end of the create banked memory function, we need to return the interface object itself. Let's set up the memory mapper with a banked region and a regular region. In this example, we'll use a bank space of FF or 255 bytes, and we'll have eight memory banks. And of course, we're going to need a CPU to work with as well. We can create memory bank device by calling our create banked memory with the params we just defined and map it to the address space that goes from address zero up until bank size. Then we can have a regular region of memory. This will take up the remaining FF00 bytes of memory and map that from where the bank memory ends at bank size to FFFF. And we'll use the remap option here as well, which will internally write the absolute addresses to the relative addresses inside the memory region. If any of this is confusing, then you might want to go back and take a look at episode 5 where we build the memory mapper interface. Now, instead of writing a whole program in the VM to check if this is working, let's actually just test it in isolation by reading and writing values to the memory mapper. We'll start out by writing the value 1 at address 0, which is of course in our banked memory region. Since the MB register will start out at 0, we'll be writing into the first memory bank. We can read the value back out to make sure that the write was indeed successful. Then we can switch banks by writing a 1 into the MB register. We'll add another log to read the data back from address 0 again. Then we can write the value 42 into address 1 again, switch the bank, and read it back again. Finally, we'll switch the bank back to 1, read the value again, switch it back to 0, and then read the value for the last time. Now, when we run this code in the terminal, we see our first write of the value 1, and then when we read it back, we see the expected value. Then when we switch memory banks and we read the value at address 0, this time we get 0, seemingly now seeing an entirely different region of memory. We write our different value, and then we switch banks again. And again, when we read, we get another 0 instead of 42. Switching back to bank 1, we see the 42 that we wrote there before, and when we switch back to bank 0, we see the original value of 1. So it seems that the memory banking mechanism is indeed working as expected. And with 255 banks of 255 bytes, we've almost doubled our effective memory. We can of course increase the bank size or the number of banked regions arbitrarily to gain even more memory. So this mechanism is quite a powerful upgrade for the virtual machine. Thank you to all the patrons of low-level JavaScript. Because of your continued support, I'm able to spend time researching and making interesting videos. If you're enjoying this series, consider sharing it with a friend or a coworker. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.